So here are some examples of correlation coefficient, right? If uh, what this shows is if all the points are exactly on a straight line, then the correlation coefficient is exactly one. If the points are almost on the straight line, very close to the line, then the correlation coefficient is very high, close to one. Okay, and as the points disperse away from the line, you're seeing that the correlation coefficient slowly decreases below one, right? So this is 0.9, this is 0.8, this is close to 0.5, right? The points are all sort of by the line. There's a general trend, but the points can be far away. Okay, and here the points are all over the place. They have many points are very far away from the line. And therefore, the correlation coefficient is pretty close to zero. Okay, and of course, all of these things, if the line was sloping the other way, you would get exactly the same numbers, except that they'll be negative numbers. That's all. Okay, and here are some more examples from Wikipedia. All the points are, this is one, this is, uh, uh, you know, 0.8, etc., etc., etc. Okay, and there are several other things. Notice that there are all kinds of patterns, but the correlation coefficient for all of these is simply zero. The moment the values are all equally distributed, you get correlation coefficient of zero or very close to zero. Okay, now correlation coefficient is a measure of the strength of linear relationship. Both correlation coefficient and covariance are measures of strength of linear relationship they don't measure the strength of any other kinds of relationships, for example, nonlinear relationships, okay? So take this example. Here, the two variables are extremely well related. You can use the value of x here to very accurately predict the value of y, okay? But the correlation coefficient is actually zero. This is a very strong quadratic relationship, but the correlation coefficient is zero, okay? This is just to re-emphasize the point that correlation coefficient actually measures the strength of linear relationship. Okay. Now here, when you have, when you calculate a correlation coefficient like R square, okay. Now typically, what you're doing is you're calculating the correlation coefficient for the sample, and then you're making an inference for the population. Okay. Now in this course, we are not really bothered too much about samples and populations, but while we are on the topic, I thought I might as well just mention this. Okay, so let's say you're trying to see the effect of, uh, uh, you know, uh, height on weight. Okay, so you might find a good correlation coefficient on your sample. You may have taken a sample of 100 people and found the correlation coefficient. But how does that correlation coefficient transfer over to the population? Okay, so that's what is statistical inference. So we have calculated something, a statistic based on the sample, but we then try to use that to extrapolate the information to the whole population, okay? So we used a sample to calculate the statistic, but how sure can I be that this calculated statistic reflects the population parameter, okay? Obviously, we cannot assume that this will be exact. So in general, when we calculate a statistic based on a sample, and try to infer the population corresponding population parameter, right? We have to make sure that our inference is actually correct, right? Because we're taking a very small sample and trying to make uh, an inference on the entire population. So how sure can we be that the calculated, st uh, the estimated parameter is actually close to the real parameter, okay? Uh, so it could happen that the sample we took was a freak and therefore it gave some value. For example, you got a very high correlation. Now that may have happened because your sample was a freak sample which had a high correlation. If you had taken a different sample, you might not have got that higher correlation, right? So what if the sample was a freak sample and we got what we observed, okay? So statisticians can compute what are called as confidence intervals for these. That is, they'll be able to say that we calculated the sample mean to be, uh, you know, 50, but the but we can show that the probability that the actual population mean is between 45 and 55 is 90 percent, 95 percent, or some such number, right? So statisticians can put a probability, can put a confidence interval on these kinds of values. We don't go into that in this course. Okay, now let's move on to a different topic. It's common for people to say a picture is worth a thousand words. 
Okay, that a picture communicates more, more effectively than a bunch of words. This is very true in the field of exploratory data analysis. So let's look at some visualization techniques, some ways of visualizing things. The first one we look at is histogram. Okay, so we've already seen that we can compute measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. Here we are computing, we are plotting what is called as a histogram of one of the attributes in our Boston housing data frame that we had created earlier, right? So here we are saying hist, H data dollar MEDV, mead val, median value of the neighborhood, of homes in a neighborhood, okay? And this is what we get. Now, what a histogram shows you is it divides the variable, the attribute that we are plotting into certain ranges, right? So here, this is uh, zero, presumably 10, 20, uh, etc. Okay, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, etc. And what it's showing you is the number of values that fall in that range, right? So this is telling you that roughly 75 values fall between 10 and 15. Okay, roughly 120 values fall between 15 and 20. And roughly 170 or 75 values fall between 20 and 25, and so on. Okay, so this is giving you a pictorial idea of how the values are distributed. Okay, so that's a very useful thing uh, in visualizing our data. So that's a histogram. Another very important or useful uh, plot is what is called as a box, box plot. And that also gives you a good idea of how the values are distributed, uh, how the values of an attribute are distributed. Okay, so here we see box plot H data dollar mead, mead value, which is really the same thing as this. Uh, the attribute is the same, MEDV. This is showing you a histogram. This is showing you a box plot of the same thing. <coughs> the box plot is also called as a box and whisker plot. Okay, uh, now the information that the box plot shows is the following. Okay, so the middle thick line, that's the median value. So this shows you that the median value is a little bit about 20. This is showing you the median is a little bit above 20 here. And then this is the 25th percentile value. That is, this is the value, if you organize the values from lowest to highest, this is the value that falls at roughly the 25% range. This is the value that, fall, value that falls at the 75% range, okay? And of course, you know that the difference between these two is the interquartile range. So this is the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is uh, you know, roughly from about, let's say, 17 to about 25. So it's about 8. Okay, now what about these values? So let's first look at these values, the, the points that are here above the this line. Those are outliers. Okay, how does the box plot calculate the outlier? It computes anything which is 1.5 times the interquartile range uh, from the 75th percentile. That's an outlier, right? So this is the 75th percentile, third quartile. And it and this is, we already know, this is the interquartile range. Any value that is one more than 1.5 IQR above this point is considered as an outlier. That's just a rule of thumb, okay? There's nothing, there's no hard and fast rule about this. This is just a convention, okay? So any of the values above that are considered as outlier values. And we already saw the impact of outliers in computations. Sometimes what we'd like to do in analytics when we are building models is to eliminate outlier values because they are freak values. We want to eliminate them and then build our model on the rest of the model or rest of the data. Okay, that's an outlier. Similarly, if there were values which were 1.5 IQR below the first quartile, below the 25 percentile, that those would also have been considered outliers, but there are no such low outliers. If they were there, we would have seen some points here as well. That's the whisker, okay? So now, uh, what are these two values? Leaving out the outliers, these two represent the minimum and maximum values in the data set, okay? This is the minimum, that's the maximum. So a box plot is a very nice way of looking at a lot of characteristics about the data set in a very condensed sort of form. A picture is indeed worth a thousand words.